Recording is now being recorded. Hi, and welcome to today's webinar entitled ESTA Implementation, the Role of Evidence-Based Practices. We're delighted to have Kyle Snow and Chris Dwyer from RMC Research Corporation join us today. Uh, before we get started, there are a few things I wanted to share with you. First of all, that um, the audio portion of, the event, of this event is only available by telephone. When you logged on, the um, platform probably asked you whether uh, you wanted it to call you or whether you wanted to call it. If you chose to um, call in, the number again is one eight seven seven four two three six three three eight, and then you'll be prompted for a passcode. That number is one four two five eight seven, followed by the pound sign. Uh, if you have any difficulties um, beyond that, uh, signing in. There's a 1-800 number you can call, 1-800-945-9120. I also wanted to briefly orient you to um, the platform we're using today. You'll notice that the presenters are available by video in front of you. Your video is activated, but you're, you don't have to um, <laughs> make yourself visible if you don't want to. Um, below that is a chat section. Please feel free to write any comments or questions that you have in there at any time during today's presentation. We really encourage informality and discussion, so feel free to jump in that way um, at any time. And then on the left, you'll see that we have a PowerPoint presentation to um, accompany today's conversation. Um, again, let us know if you have any questions or comments in the chat box. Thank you very much. So let me tell you a little bit about who we are. The Appalachia Regional Comprehensive Center is a member of the Comprehensive Center Network, which you can now see from the new um, Comprehensive Center Network portal available at the URL listed here. You can learn about the um, breadth of work that we do across the nation. And as you can see in the map in the lower right corner, um, the Appalachia Regional Comprehensive Center serves Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia. We are funded by the U.S. Department of Education to provide technical assistance to state departments of education. I'm delighted to introduce today's discussants to you. Kyle Snow and Chris Dwyer are both with the RMC Research Corporation. Kyle is a team member with the Appalachia Regional Comprehensive Center, and both Kyle and Chris also work with the Mid-Atlantic Comprehensive Center and Chris with the Northeast Comprehensive Center as well. But i really like to give them an opportunity to share a little bit about their background and their interests. So I'm going to turn it over to Kyle and Chris to tell us a little bit about their background before we move into the content of today's conversation. Kyle? Sure. Thank you, um, Kevin, and welcome, everyone to uh, today's webinar. My name is Kyle Snow, and I am with, with RMC Research Corporation, as Kevin said. Um, my background is really as a developmental psychologist in child development, um, but with that background, I kind of took the direction of heading into education policy, uh, particularly relating research to policy, uh, hence the, uh, the topic that we are with us today. And Chris? Yes. Um, uh, I really think of myself as a school person. I spent a lot of time both working with schools and as a teacher myself, uh, particularly in early childhood and elementary school, and then really moved into doing program evaluation work. Probably my most um, relevant work for today's topic uh, is the seven years I spent working with the IES practice guides. I was part of the team that took the practice practice guides and uh, turn them into videos and tools for the Doing What Works site. So this notion of practices that have strong evidence, moderate evidence, weak evidence um, is, is uh, very close to me, especially in literacy and mathematics. Thank you both very much. Should I jump in, Caitlin, or do you have any more words yeah, before we no, go for it. It's all yours. take off? So thank you. And um, what you see in front of you is an overview slide. Um, I do this as much for me as for anybody else just to keep me on track. Uh, we have a, a few points I want to try to touch on a little bit here. And we're going to you know, try to vary our pace in response to questions and things that come up in the chat box. Uh, so please yeah, you know, let us know if we are – 
going too quickly or too slowly, and we will try to adjust on the on the fly. It's always tricky when you can't see your audience to figure out how you're doing, so um, can take advantage of the typing. Um, we're going to start today with just a real, I mean, real quick second talking about the important role that evidence has played in U.S. education policy in the recent past. We're going to talk about, uh, under the current law, the use of defining as peers of evidence, and, and then go from there into how do we identify what really activate, what, what really are evidence-based practices and activities under these tiers of evidence. Um, Chris is going to talk a lot about uh, what's called Tier 4. Uh, tier 4, as we'll get into, is a really um, unique part of the way that evidence is being talked about in, in the current education law, and is a great opportunity for, for states and local school systems to really be um, creative and innovative. And then, of course, we have the inclusion questions towards the uh, towards the end there. So that's kind of the overview of where we're going to go. And um, again, this is not a an exhaustive coverage of this topic, tiny stretch, uh, more of an introduction to it to um, get us all in the center in, into the center, so we can um, dive into some really uh, more additional additionally challenging issues um, later on. Oops. So you know the, the role of evidence in U.S. education policy is not new. Of course, the um, Rule governing education policy, at least just in the, the K-12 space, is the Elementary Secondary Education Act. Um, and this current instantiation is the Every Student Succeeds Act. Uh, some of you may know this in its prior version called the No Child Left Behind Act. One thing to know is they're all kind of saying the same thing. It's the same overarching law that uh, governs uh, how the federal education department interacts with these states and, and then in some ways how the states interact with the local agencies within them. Um, in both No Child Left Behind and in the Every Student Succeeds Act, the current version, there is a, a real interest in bringing evidence into or research base uh, into the the way that we do education in this country. Um, the, the idea, of course, is that it's better to, you know, think about, think about spending uh, billions of dollars to have some uh, idea that it actually is likely to be effective or work, um, whether it be through research or evidence based or however, whatever words we're going to use to define it. That's really the interest behind um, No Child Left Behind. Uh, the No Child Left Behind uh, version of the bill talks a lot about scientifically based research. Um, it's that phrase, scientifically based research, many people did some counts of it anywhere over 100, 110 times that that show up in the law. It's a very big part of No Child Left Behind. But really what scientifically based research under No Child Left Behind meant is the use of random, randomized control trials. This is a type of research design that is really very, um, very simply kind of the way we test drugs. So you take a, a, a drug off the shelf and you um, assign half, half the people that want to be in the study, half people in the study to receive the drug and half to not receive the drug. Um, and you see how effective it is at the end of the day. That's, that's like the shortest definition of random clinical trial ever, uh, but, but you get the, the gist of it. And that was really the crux of how No Child Left Behind saw research. Um, for, for folks who uh, are in research or who write about or read about or think about research, random clinical trials are kind of the, the holy grail of research design. So it's the top most um, demanding design that there is. And so as a consequence, the research base in the No Child Behind was really focused in on this um, sort of higher, very top level of, of piece of the of the research puzzle. That and we'll talk about that more in a little bit. Under the uh, under S under Every Student Succeeds Act, uh, there's been a shift to this phrase evidence based. Um, so it's kind of taking the same role as scientific based research to give us some. Um, some scientific undergirding to our practices, um, but instead of being scientifically based research, the phrase evidence based uh, shows up. And importantly, uh, instead of just focusing on random clinical trials, uh, ESSA really focuses on four tiers of evidence based research. Again, we'll get into what those are a little bit later on. The key point is while random clinical trials are still part of the mix here, uh, ESSA really recognizes a broader definition of research to support programs. So while there is the um, 
most rigorous type of research design included as part of the evidence base, so are some of the less rigorous research designs um, through the various tiers that we'll talk about. One of the things that this does is provide much more flexibility in state, to states and local agencies to really match what their needs are with what there's evidence to suggest would be effective for them without needing to um, rely on there being that, that clinical trials kind of study. One of the real limitations of, of limiting your definition to clinical trials research is that that's only a small proportion of all the research that gets done. So you're leaving an awful lot on the sidelines by, by um, focusing only on that kind of a design. And uh, the four tiers of evidence-based research really opens up the, the, the definition to include this broader breadth of evidence. One of the things that happens when you do that is instead of someone saying to you, this is what constitutes the best uh, research evidence that there is available, it really requires everyone to um, develop this sort of culture of evidence or critical evaluation of research so that across the various tiers of evidence base, uh, not all studies are going to be created equal by design, but also the studies that are going to apply to the problem uh, or to the challenges, the needs identified by schools locally uh, in very different ways. And so the idea is that by, by giving this, flexi this flexibility, recognizing the broader range of research, there is this um, emergent idea of, of culture of evidence that should be driving our decision making as school systems. And I mentioned the role of research and ethics as a graphic. I'm a visual person, as anyone who ever looks in my office will, will attest. Uh, there are four um, tiers of evidence as are shown here in the pyramid in the, in the middle of the screen. And we'll get into what all these are in a few moments. The important element here is research recognized under No Child Left Behind, as indicated by the box on the left, really is in this top box is strong evidence, what, what ESSA refers to as strong evidence, clinical trials, uh, research. Um, whereas the research that can support practices under ESSA really exists across all the tiers of evidence. Now, within ESSA, um, research or evidence based shows up in a couple of different ways, and in three different ways, really. There are some aspects of the ESSA law that requires um, that practices be evidence-based. Um, and so we're going to start with those. The others will follow on um, the next couple of slides. For the most part, the re what the this idea of requirement means is that states have to uh, provide funding to certain programs, and that, that, pro that program funding must be evidence-based. Okay, so the states uh, are, are given money from the firm of ed, um, that money is intended to be spent on programs uh, of a particular uh, type, um, and those programs must be supported by uh, the evidence, but must be evidence based. This is particularly true in Title I. Um, for those who get into policy talk, there, there are some notations that you'll see throughout the slides in various sections and things um, that's for your benefit. If you're not into that kind of thing, then you can just sort of kind of gloss over that a little bit. Don't get too tied up in it. Um, so Title I, um, Section 103, uh, includes 7% set aside. Again, that's a formulaic piece for policy speakers. Um, that's a pretty big chunk of change under the funding that's targeted towards school improvement. Okay, and you, you, you may have heard about school improvement projects, school improvement grants that comes out of this title, uh, the 7% set aside. And, uh, so under ESSA, states must fund programs to um, help improve schools um, that are struggling and these programs must be evidence-based. It's also a bit of uh, this requirement and requirement that programs be evidence-based in Title I under parent and child engagement provisions. Other parts of ESSA um, talk about allowing evidence-based. And in these provisions, states and local agencies are encouraged to invest funds in evidence-based activities if they are funding those activities. So unlike Title I, then uh, require certain things to be funded, there are other aspects of ESSA where states and localities have the option for, for funding programs. So for these provisions, if the state and locality chooses to uh, fund certain activities, then there's an encouragement that they uh, be evidence-based, um, and the state to, to, to sort of build that in has to demonstrate there is some reasonably available evidence to it. Okay, so that shows up in parts of Title II, which is where the teacher training and preparation and recruitment pieces. Um, Title IV, so through the support grants, uh, and also some of the competitive grant programs. Finally, there are elements of ESSA where these evidence-based is incentivized, meaning states aren't required to fund certain programs 
Um, and if they do, it's not really they're not really required to use an evidence base, um, but there's some kind of incentive to do that. So kind of the optional give you extra points in the scoring. Um, this is typically true of a lot of competitive grant programs. And some of those are listed on the, the screen here, the seed grants, the Orange Family Engagement Centers, um, uh, LEARN, and so on. Uh, in all these cases where the competitive grants are incentivized, um, proposing to conduct uh, programs or interventions that fall within the top three tiers of evidence give you a competitive advantage. And I haven't told you what those are yet, but um, that means having some you know, degree of strength in evidence will give you a competitive advantage to getting a program funded. Thanks, Kyle. So we're about to dive into um, understanding how ESSA frames these tiers of evidence. But before we do that, does anyone have any questions or observations at this point? That sounds like a no. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So these tiers of evidence are four tiers of evidence, and very obvious question is, well, how are these defined? Um, these are defined in the law itself, so it's not um, you know, sort of trying to figure it out. Um, the law actually provides for a pretty good definition of what these tiers are. Um, as I said, it includes the sort of consideration of where there is existing research or existing research studies of various kinds that the tiers wants to trace. But also includes this tier four, which we'll talk about more in more depth in more depth in the uh, the latter part of the talk, which is not so much um, that there are a whole bunch of research studies about an intervention, but that there is a capacity to build that research base within the law. That's a real key difference um, in how evidence and research is thought about under ESSA than No Child Left Behind. It's kind of research or evidence building function. Um, the first three tiers, uh, you'll see uh, again. We'll get into the definitions in a moment really provide more flexibility and options to meet local needs. So, so each one of those tiers, one through three, has some evidence behind it. Um, the evidence is of varying strength according to different definitions of research design and so on. Um, but by broadening the pool of potential evidence, you actually have a greater likelihood of having some evidence base informing what you're doing uh, rather than um, relying on if there's no uh, tier one research base, then you're kind of stuck. So you have the option to uh, apply a broader range of research to meet local needs. Uh, what that does, though, is opens up the door for potentially contradictory and consistent findings. When there are a lot of different studies at play, it gets really, frankly, very complex and very confusing, and um, really requires more of those of us in education to be more critical consumers of what we're trying to do. So states must determine, uh, under ASSA, must determine how to manage the identification of interventions at each of these levels of, of evidence. That's going to be one thing we'll talk about in a few moments. Under this tier four, really, as I said, it opens the door for innovation. So these are uh, a, a space for uh, a locality or state to say, hey, we, we think for various reasons that we'll get into that, that this is going to work, but we're going to, so we're going to implement this. But then we're also going to take advantage of that implementation to do some research while we're trying this out. So it's really a, an opportunity for states to build and contribute to the research base. And Importantly, states can, they can choose to pursue this function or not, and it's not a required. Um, Chris is going to talk a lot about why this is a wonderful opportunity for, for states and localities to contribute to the, to the research base of what works. So how do we define these four tiers of evidence? Um, the law gives several characteristics. I'm not going to hit all of them. We're going to hit a few of them um, just really very briefly. First is research design. So what is the actual uh, construction of the research study that is coming into play. Um, one of the things that's important to note is that research designs really in the law are defined within the space of quantitative research uh, research studies. Those studies are really numerically based as opposed to qualitative research studies. Um, it's not, not to say that qualitative research designs cannot be very, very rigorous or very vigorous, it's just how the law happens to be written. Um, the research designs used here reflect a lot of the uh, convention and, and, and ideas um, that are that are found in the What Works Clearinghouse, uh, which came out under No Child Left Behind. Um, sample size of the study also becomes part of the um, characteristics identified the, the study into, into each of its tiers. Generally speaking, um, research that has that built on large samples um, are giving given a more uh, considered to be a little more vigorous, more rigorous. Um, probably this is because they oftentimes include relevant subgroups. They also provide different types of statistical advantages. 
So when we talk about the various tiers, you'll see some reference to sample size being an issue here. One of the things that uh, focus on sample size really challenges us is that some of the things that we might see in education just are not, um, don't lend themselves so well to very large scale research because the phenomena, although it's, it's reasonably common across the country, may not be very concentrated and allow for an easy, allow very easily for a large sample size study to, to take place. So again, there's a little bit of a, a challenge um, in meeting that definition. Um, and finally, the strength of the effect. So, you know, so a research study is undertaken to demonstrate a relationship between a couple of variables, that's sort of a basic idea. And the effect can be um, strong, weak, or non-existent. Um, in, in the parlance that we talk about are statistically significant effects. So these are effects that really we have confidence are, are real uh, and, and due to what we think they're, the study is telling us they're due to. Um, and the certain, this effect ought to be, um, under these series of evidence, on a relevant outcome. So if you're looking at interventions to improve literacy, um, greater sense of self-efficacy among students might be a wonderful outcome, but not a relevant outcome to the intervention. And so it has to be looked at in a different, slightly different way. An important element of how all this works is, um, I would put here in quotes, this is my shorthand, not the law, sh the law shorthand, is the at least one study rule. And so the idea here is that if there's at least one study that meets the highest tier criteria, highest tier criteria, the NEST study um, represents the highest level of evidence and says the most evidence-based, if you will, um, study that's out there. When you open the door to consider all sorts of studies, multiple studies of different types of designs, what you find is they're very seldom. It's just one study. So this at least one study has meeting this highest tier uh, of evidence base becomes really critical to, to think about, especially as we're looking at the possibility of having multiple studies again, potentially with um, with conflicting findings. So graphically, we can show what the difference between these four tiers are uh, in this table. So we have them layered up by the names in the law, strong evidence, moderate evidence, promising evidence, and then demonstrated rationale. Um, and just want to highlight a couple of the differences. So um, on this screen, you see that across these first three tiers of, of evidence, the, the, the nature of the research design really differs with the strong evidence um, uh, level of evidence really being driven by experimental study. So this is randomized controlled trials, very much like was described under No Shell Left Behind. For moderate evidence um, interventions or programs, quasi-experimental study, uh, stu studies can give you or count as evidence. Um, so you may not have random assignment of, stu of students to conditions. You may have all the statistical controls that you might have in an experimental study. It's still a pretty vigorous study where you have multiple groupings and you might do some other way of controlling for, for groups. Um, the promising evidence uh, tier uh, is really where correlational studies fall into place. So correlational studies, you're not necessarily controlling one variable to see its effect on another in any way, shape, or form, just like you know, what's naturally occurring. Um, you can put statistical controls on that study afterwards um, to help strengthen that, that study. Um, but again, this sort of represents um, if, if you're in a, sitting in a class of experimental design, the sequence from very vigorous research design to much less vigorous research design, but still a research design. And that's an important point to take away, that these levels of evidence are all um, research-based in one way or the other. Again, those two other points about sample size and statistically significant effects um, show up. Those show up across all of the uh, top three tiers of evidence, um, except for uh, tier three, the promising evidence. Not that large samples are not a good thing for correlational studies. It's just that uh, within that tier of evidence, the, the um, extrication of having a large sample is not set to the same level as in the top two tiers. And finally, you have this sort of anomalous group down on the bottom here, demonstrated rationale, which is different in name but also in description. These are, this level of evidence describes um, a, a set of studies or a, a situation where there's some kind of really well-specified logic model. There's some reason to think that this is going to work from research and other other experience, but there's not a particular set of research studies out there to draw from, but there could be. And so this is considered a tier of evidence for many aspects of ESSA, um, not necessarily for all of them, but for some of them. Again, we're going to come back to that at the end with a, a lot more deep dive, so I'm not going to go too much into that at the moment. 
So you have four tiers of evidence. They vary a little bit in terms of their experimental design, and um, uh, but all of them, uh, certainly once or three, everyone would agree constitute different types of research, uh, and even part, uh, even uh, tier four um, has to have some research-based rationale behind it, or there's some research out there that contributes to an idea that it should work. So with all that in mind, all those various studies floating around, and in some cases there may be very few studies, it may be very many studies, uh, states have to figure out how to manage the identification of the interventions uh, that might fall at each level. So you might be looking at um, wanting to really turn around this very low-performing school, it's an urban school or it's a rural school, let's say. Um, let me find all the research and stuff. You might find a handful of studies on efforts to turn around rural schools that are struggling. How do you know uh, what, which study carries the most weight, which could be the best evidence. And in general, what we're seeing now, both Chris and I working with state uh, through the comp centers, is a couple of different models show up. Uh, in one case, and as you see on the left, the state agency may provide a list of evidence-based options and, and sort of say, here's what we figured out where that option falls, and um, go ahead and choose what you're going to do. Very simple, very straightforward in many ways. Uh, very similar to the way under No Child Left Behind, where once something was um, did it was expected or did it deemed to be uh, research-based or scientifically research-based, it got a little thicker on it, and you can very readily identify it. So it's a very nice way of sort of sorting out the universe, I guess. Um, but we're also seeing, in some cases, that states are providing guidance to the local agency to identify evidence-based options on their own. So rather than give a, a very circumscribed, sometimes, uh, list of options, the state is providing some support for the, for the local agencies to really look at the research themselves and construct their own sense of what the what this what tiers of evidence looks like, and make a choice between those two. Now, probably not surprisingly, we do see the possibility of there being some overlap where states are doing uh, some combination of providing some list for something possibly and providing some support for how to choose amongst options uh, for for locals in other cases. So that's a really quick glossing over of what is really a very complicated um, process. Let me complicate it a bit more, and then we'll we'll get some questions and some reactions. So you have to identify these these activities, and regardless of whether the state is constructing a list or the local agency is constructing a list, or there's some collaboration between the two, um, I think there are these four really critical considerations that come into the conversation. Um, the first is the breadth of evidence and the breadth of research that comes into play. As I mentioned earlier, um, by opening up the, the definition of evidence base to include a, 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 a wider range of research design, you're opening up the door to, to a great many more research studies, which is wonderful. Um, the problem, in a way, is that some, sometimes they suggest different things, sometimes contradictory things. They may not be as applicable, that is, research studies that you're finding may not be as applicable. So we have to really take the totality of what the research evidence suggests um, within the law and in the guidance from the department talks a lot about, you know, what happens if you've got a tier two intervention study um, that suggests this is not effective, um, but a tier one study that shows that this, the very same thing is effective. And then what if you have another tier two that shows it's ineffective? How do you balance that out? You have multiple studies of less strength, contradictory, um, a single study of, of stronger strength. So states and localities have to figure out how to, how to balance those things. Um, number two, the relevance of the evidence to the setting, the population, and the need that you're trying to, trying to hit. And there's, the door is open to a broader range of research, but there's not been research done on every possible thing. Um, so if you are in an urban school system uh, dealing with a very um, unique population, you're trying to solve a very unique problem, there may not be research studies that speak directly to that constellation of factors. They have to figure out how to interpret the research that is existing and how it might inform what you're doing within your, lo within your local setting, the population of, need, uh, of students that you work with and need, and so on. Uh, the third, the third um, consideration is the capacity to effectively implement the activity. So one of the things that was interesting about the No Child Behind era for random clinical trials is that lots of things were attempted to be studied in the clinical trials, um, especially curricula. But we were finding on the evaluation side that schools and, and classrooms had a hard time actually implementing the curriculum, for example, or the thing, 
the way that we thought they were going to do and in a consistent way. You know, implementation was hard. There's no surprise to anyone on, on this webinar and watching this webinar who's a teacher. Actually, doing things in the real world is very different than doing them from a study, when you're doing a study on them. But these, these variation uh, or the differences in how uh, where, where, where schools and local agencies are enabled in their ability to implement activities um, becomes really critically important. So you may find the, the best things in sliced bread, but realize that it requires you to have twice the number of teachers than your school system has. So considering that, that capacity to implement as designed. And finally, the cost benefits analysis. Um, and really here, well, I want, I want to think about um, cost in terms of finance, but also time and opportunity cost in education. Any, any hour you spend doing one thing is an hour you're not spend doing something else. Right? So it's a real important balancing act between, um, you know, this program might be, re be research-based but require me to spend four hours a day. This other, other program might be a little bit less impactful in terms of outcomes, but I want to spend an hour a day doing that with my students, that, that creates a, a, the sort of cost-benefit analysis that has to come into play. So all four of these considerations, and, and there are probably many, many more, uh, come into how do we map out the, the, brain, the breadth of research that's out there to meet our, our locally defined or locally identified needs. So I thought you were going to complicate things a little bit. I, I do apologize <laughs> uh, for that. But I think it's a good time to, to stop and catch our breath, catch my breath anyway. Uh, and also um, open up for any possible reactions or questions. Well, thank you very much, Kyle, for uh, making the, this is even more complex. Um, <laughs> I, I do think that you make a great point, though, that sometimes the um, tiers can appear cleaner um, on paper than they do in practice in, in real schools and classrooms. So I appreciate you pointing out these um, nuances. I am curious if anyone has encountered some of them in their own um, uh, districts or state departments. Okay. Well, I appreciate you uh, um, discussing kind of uh, how these um, factors um, have to be taken into account when we're looking at even the most rigorous tier of evidence. Oh, thank you. Um, so I mentioned, I'll just segue over to Chris here, that tier four is an unusual piece. Um, and, and we um, who work in policy and with states really get excited about this as being a really great opportunity. Um, so Chris, do you want to want to jump in? Sure. Um, I think one reason why we wanted to focus on Tier 4 a little separately is we don't want you to think of it as a, a default or just a permission to select any practice or if you're an SEA, um, a permission to kind of uh, go ahead and approve anything that <clears throat> is presented by an LEA for one of these programs. It, it, it really is, I think, going to be an area where uh, it will grow in interest and grow in potential, but only if we pay attention to what it's really trying to do. So it's called in the law, demonstrates the rationale. But you've already seen from what Kyle has said, you can't just go by the titles of these things. You can't just look at strong, moderate, or promising and give them your own uh, generic meanings, which, uh, frankly, I, I have seen some states do. The definitions really are about research design in under those titles. In this case, um, the title demonstrates a rationale. I want to unpack a little bit. I've seen it referred to as under evaluation or evidence building. And I think those are two really good monikers because they describe a critical thing about this. It's not just about what you might, if you didn't know anything else but demonstrate a rationale, um, how you might go about it. It really does have an evaluation component, and that's what we want to look at. So the, the uh, demonstrates a rationale means that the rationale connects to existing research findings, perhaps a study that was done uh, at a different uh, 
level, maybe something that was done at an elementary level that you're trying to transfer to a high school, maybe something that was done with an English-only population, like a vocabulary building uh, program that you want to try with um, English language learners. But there is a rationale for why you're selecting this for the need that you have, and you're connecting that argument to an existing research base. And that research base has shown that the strategy, the program, the intervention does improve outcomes. And so you have a reason to think in your use it will improve outcomes. And just like the others, those outcomes are either student outcomes or they may be other relevant outcomes, for example, a teacher practice. Now, in addition to demonstrating that rationale, uh, there's also a requirement an, uh, for evaluating the effects of that program. So already you can see that in many ways Tier 4 uh, represents a higher bar in terms of the amount of work that you would have to do to uh, implement the program. You're not really simply saying here's the study or set of studies that shows why I've selected this program. Here you're actually doing that plus an evaluation plan. So if you're um, an LEA or an, an SEA, you know, you've got these two parts you're demonstrating. Uh, probably the best way, most efficient way to show the likelihood of achieving outcomes is to develop some type of logic model, to present a logic model that expresses the rationale along with the link to the studies, and an evaluation plan. It may not at this stage be uh, a Tier 1 or even a Tier 2 evaluation plan. It may be a simpler evaluation plan to begin to collect some data about the, the effects upon implementation. So those two pieces um, have to go along with it, whether you're promoting it as an LEA or whether as a state you're approving it. So why would you even allow this or why would you even want to go there? Well. You know, we know that in a lot of the areas that um, people may want to be uh, using resources for, using ESSA resources for, there simply may not be a reasonably available studies. Some of the areas that are uh, of, of greatest interest, competency-based education, application of technology, it's going to be probably pretty hard to find Tier 1, 2, or 3 studies that pinpoint um, positive effects, positive outcomes uh, for exactly the implementation that you would like to use in, in your own district. Uh, as we've already said, Tier 1, 2, 3 interventions often have been used with a particular population. Maybe they've been used with a special needs population. Uh, you have uh, you're using it in a broader population, perhaps with high mobility, or a different language group, or a different grade level. So all of those uh, aspects of the Tier 1, 2, 3 studies come into play when you think about how it will be applied in your situation. Um, the the uh, other thing, that, and I think this is going to be very common, is you'll find studies that were very rigorously done, but they're on a very small scale. We've had a lot of literacy studies like that, for example. And the, uh, the, the notion of large sample, you're looking at 300 to 350 students in that sample. And, you know, many of our, many of our well-known studies in peer-reviewed journals have been done on smaller samples than that. So you may want to, um, you, you may want to use something that's been well tested, but it doesn't really meet those tier one, two, three um, requirements. In the, in the way that um, Kyle laid them out. Uh, but I think also, in an important way, you may want to champion innovations and augment this pool of interventions that are backed by some level of evidence, because in your state there may be some really important, um, consistent patterns of need that um, that people want to test out interventions and strategies that they think will will work to ameliorate those needs. So this whole idea of uh, 
contributing to the research base, building a culture of evidence is really important here. But as I say that, I want to remind you that uh, that Tier 4 is not allowed for Title I school improvement plans or some of the competitive preferences in grant programs. Some of the places where I think we're going to see Tier 4 applied, Title I parent and family engagement is going to be a really useful area there. Title II professional development, teacher learning, teacher, pra teacher application of what they've learned in professional development. Title IV, where you might see use of technology, uh, social emotional interventions, for example, other changes related to school climate. There's some implications for the state role particularly, and you can, if you're an LEA, you can also um, think, about, uh, think about these implications that uh, this notion of this culture of evidence, you're, you want to promote investment in proven practices, really taking that seriously. And so, you know, I, I would say I've seen in my career often people um, for, telling people that they must use research-based interventions, and then on the other end of that, uh, in areas where people simply can't find those research-based interventions or they want to argue for what um, they're interested in using that doesn't have any research, people sort of turn a blind eye to that and simply say, well, it's, you know, it's been written up in, a, in, a, in an article or they just assume it's research-based. Here we're really trying to turn the corner on that and actually promote investment in proven practices. And that's where this Tier 4 is kind of a relief valve for that. It does mean uh, that high quality needs assessments are important. We really want LEAs to be pinpointing needs uh, because we're going to be matching research-based interventions and strategies to those needs. So it calls for paying perhaps more attention to needs assessment than has been done before, not simply filling in a cookie cutter sheet uh, uh, about uh, sort of traditional data about the school, but actually taking a deeper look at needs. And then related to that, it means approving those plans, looking at those plans, looking at the selection of interventions in light of the needs that were identified. That goes back to the grade levels, the populations, the particular context. So that's both more a higher obligation on the part of LEAs as well as SEAs. One thing that you might see is more piloting work done, encouraging piloting, trying things out. Um, I don't have on the slide, but certainly there should be a bullet that says, a uh, much higher expectation on figuring out how to help districts understand what interventions are available in a different area, help districts weigh the evidence that's there, and uh, basically help people figure out whether there is something that has a proven practice that can meet that, um, you know, fifth grade need for uh, improving students' understanding of fractions, ratios, et cetera. And, you know, that's one place where the comprehensive centers come in, the regional labs come in, uh, because, it, you know, some state departments have that research capacity and, and some do not. But if we want to make this real, we're really going to have to help point LEAs to where they're going to find this information. And then finally, states may want to consider how they're going to help invest in evaluation. So that putting the burden of carrying out a formal evaluation on districts without any help is a big burden. So being able to use perhaps some set-aside dollars at the state level to help support evaluations in areas that are likely to be important to uh, lots of different districts. And so those would be some ways to consider how you might help to fund this aspect. So that's a little bit about Tier 4. Thanks very much, Chris. I really think that your um, uh, points about how Tier 4 can be really an opportunity to contribute to an evidence base that is always um, 
being developed. It's, you know, we haven't, we don't have all the answers and we never will. And so this is an opportunity for some real applied research and evaluation to be conducted. Um, but you also mentioned that um, it comes with some opportunity cost in that it requires ongoing evaluation. Um, I'm asking you to speculate here, but do you suppose that that will have the effect of um, constraining states or districts from um, really considering implementation of Tier 4 kinds of practices or interventions? You know, I think it could. I think uh, one um, strategy that states may want to use is to not require, um, I'll use the term sophisticated, uh, evaluations at the outset, but to try to do pilots that have shorter term evaluations that may have a lower bar to begin seeing if there's promise in the effects, and then invest as a state in partnership with an LEA in, um, if something does show a great deal of promise, in either partnering them up with someone in their own state, perhaps a university, perhaps a regional lab, uh, to be able to carry out an evaluation. Or partner districts that are working together is another option so that you can expand. People are investing in a, a common strategy, maybe a common data collection but there are three or four districts that are doing this that have high needs. There's also, uh, you know, in Title IV, for example, there is the option for the SEA to uh, treat those dollars competitively and hold um, and not simply give them out by formula so that they may want to be investing in um, a smaller number of grants that have a valuation coming along with those grants on behalf of learning some strategies that then can be disseminated statewide. Thanks, Chris. It's really helpful to be reminded of the various supports and ways of self-organizing that can permit those kinds of uh, investigations. So we've thrown a lot at folks today. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments or observations? You're welcome to type in the chat box or just speak up. Okay, well, if there are no questions, um, Kyle and Chris, do you have any final comments that you'd like to make? I think uh, I would just say it's very early, and um, it feels like ESSA has been around for a while to some of us, but we, we know on the ground it's still very early. So there's a lot of room to experiment with um, with. Uh, these ideas as uh, people are starting to move into it. And so while, you know, there's a lot of flexibility in how states and locals spend the ESSA dollars, a lot of different possibilities for allowable uses, this evidence base I think people are just beginning to realize is a theme that runs through all of it. So taking a little bit more time than sometimes we do to both do needs assessments develop plans, figure out what the right interventions are, and then uh, get some feedback on those plans. It's something that I don't think people have often been used to because the plan writing sometimes happens near the end of the school year. But given that we're just at the beginning of all this, it would be really worthwhile to take the time to take those steps very deliberately. Mm -hmm. Yep, great point. Yeah, I think, I think the phrase Chris, and I think also, um, you know, this is a very general, uh, sometimes rapid fire introduction to ESSA. Um, and so there's a lot of detail and, and you know, the materials will be available um, for people to go back to and for others who weren't actually listening in live. But I think one of the things that struck me, especially towards the end, Chris, of your comments, is this almost palpable shift in how we really need to be thinking about evidence and research and how we do education. So instead of just going and taking the research, scientifically research-based book off the shelf and giving it to a school to do, which is maybe one way that you could think about um, a very prescriptive, limited way of thinking about evidence, 
when I open the door to say, okay, he, there's a whole bunch of research out there that could inform what you're doing. Oh, and by the way, it'd be really helpful, especially under Tier 4, but also regardless of what level of evidence exists, to be paying attention because it, there might be a couple of really wonderful Tier 1 or Tier 2 studies that suggest doing this thing, but for whatever reason, it's not giving you the results that you think you're going to get. And, and because, it's, you know, it's almost impossible to have done every research study, every possible combination of things. And so this this culture of evidence, I think, is really the exciting piece of it, getting really trying to encourage the application of research or evidence-based approaches into um, to an active verb from more of a passive verb. And it can have it implemented is, is really exciting. Chris, as you said, we're very, very early in, in that process, especially when we're wanting to be actively engaged. So I, I'm looking forward to continuing this uh, this work and this, and this conversation. I would say just one more thing, and it's from a project I worked on a long, long time ago with a number of states. The states every year uh, brought together the LEAs and had them share what they'd learned from their own implementations and their own uh, evaluations of particular projects in their sites. And I think we often don't do that with Title I, Title II, Title IV. I would say it was a very exciting um, annual meeting for those locals and states because they were learning from each other. They were sharing not sophisticated research in most cases, but they were sharing their uh, attempts at outcomes, whether they were pre and post outcomes, whether they were observations. And they began to build up a, a much stronger um, sense of inquiry, a much stronger interest in results, a much stronger interest in research in general. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. That's really exciting to uh, to hear. Thanks for sharing that. Um, well, thank you very much, Kyle and Chris. And I'll for, uh, I'd like to preview for everyone that we have a follow-on webinar planned, um, and this one will um, sort of uh, launch, be launched from what we talked about today to delve into how states are. Um, actually helping districts to make these determinations about evidence-based practices for implementation. Um, and we'll, we'll uh, feature a couple of tools and processes that they're using. So we'll get much more practical in the uh, follow-on webinar. Um, please visit us on the web, on Twitter, on YouTube, anytime. I also want to let you know that um, the webinar recording will be posted to our YouTube channel, and you'll also be able to link to it from our website. Um, and then finally, um, you'll be getting an email shortly that will thank you for your participation, first of all, but then also invite you to complete a very short evaluation survey. You're not required to, but we sure would appreciate your feedback. Thanks very much. And again, Kyle and Chris, thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Yeah, bye.